Hey, future respiratory therapist. So today we're going to talk about mixed acidosis. This is a question that comes to me from Kwaku, and they want to know about one, mostly how do we treat mixed acidosis, but also how do we recognize it. And so we're going to break that down and talk to you about it for now. Okay. So when we talk about a mixed acidosis, we're talking about a pH that is acidotic, that is being caused by both the respiratory or the pulmonary component of the blood gas and also the metabolic component of the blood gas. So here's what it looks like. Okay. So we're talking about mixed acidosis. This is what we're talking about, okay? Mixed acidosis. Now, when we talk about it, we got a pH that's going to be acidotic. So let's just go 7.10. We're going to have a PaCO2 that's high because that is going to make it acidotic on the respiratory side of things. So normal is 35 to 45. So we just got to go higher than that. So we're just going to say 70. Um, we're going to go a bicarb of, and when we talk about bicarb, we got to go less than 22, right? To be mixed, we have to be less than 22, so let's just go 12. And then we talk about O2, and we can go anything from 50. Now, you understand that this doesn't pertain necessarily to the mixed acidosis. When you talk about interpreting blood gases, when you're talking about pH balance, the oxygen is never really part of the component to determine whether it's a respiratory acidosis, a respiratory alkalosis, a metabolic acidosis, a metabolic alkalosis, compensated, partially compensated. It's never really part of the problem. It's, never really, it's not a part of the, of, of the equation. So when you're talking about pH balance, you're really just talking about CO2 and bicarb being in balance to create a normal pH. That's the first thing to understand. So I can essentially take PaO2 off the board, right? Now, we understand that PO2 plays a part in this process, but it's really not part of the conversation when you're interpreting blood gases. So I'm just going to take it off. I'm going to leave it away. Now, this is a mixed acidosis. Why? Because the pH is down. That makes this acidotic. Our CO2 is up. This will cause an acidosis. And we have bicarb that is down, which will also cause an acidosis. So we have two components here, our metabolic and our respiratory components that are causing an acidosis, which is being revealed by our pH as an acidotic problem. So in this case, the problem is, is, well, how do we treat it? And when will we expect to see this? Okay. So I'm going to give you a couple of scenarios here. Okay. And then I'm going to give you our role as respiratory therapists. Now, I'm going to take this off the board because I don't want to I don't want to confuse what might be happening here, okay? A lot of times we'll see a blood gas like this when we draw a gas either during a code or just after a code. So, patient goes into cardiac arrest, CPR is started, the patient may be intubated, they may be put on mechanical ventilation, and we draw a blood gas. And this is what we get. Now, how do we interpret what is happening and, and make sense of all of this? So a lot of times this is a blood gas. The interpretation is simple. You already have it. We've already talked about it. We've already said that this is a mixed acidosis, right? Now just think, status post cardiac arrest. The patient's heart stopped. Therefore, they stopped breathing. That would cause the CO2 to go up. Okay? That part makes sense, right? The part that usually gets most people is why, with the cardiac arrest, will I see a decrease in bicarb? And the answer is simply this. Remember, guys, the heart is responsible for taking 
the oxygen enriched blood that comes from the heart comes from the lungs and then dumps into the left ventricle and then is pumped out to systemic circulation for aerobic metabolism. The tissues take the oxygen, they metabolize it, they produce CO2, they give that CO2 back to the blood as it returns back to the lungs venous, the, uh, um, via the, the venous return system, which is the vena cava, which dumps back into the right atrium, the right ventricle. The deoxygenated blood then goes through the lungs. It gives off CO2. We exhale the CO2. It also picks up blood, I mean oxygen, and then sends that oxygenated blood back to the left side of the heart. Now, during cardiac arrest, all of this gets screwed up because there is no cardiac perfusion. The tissues are out here going, where's my oxygen? Can I get it? Where's my oxygen? And they're not getting it. So the tissues don't just die. They don't just say, oh, no oxygen, eh, I give up. The tissues say, hey, no worries, I have a backup plan. I'm going to go into anaerobic metabolism, which means they're going to start burning the stored uh, fats, carbohydrates, sugars that are in the area around. They're going to they're going to they're going to switch from saying, "Okay, we'll burn oxygen and produce CO2" to a state of anaerobic metabolism that is going to burn stored carbohydrates and sugars and fats and say, "Okay, well if I have to burn these, then the offset, the byproduct of that is lactic acid." Now you need to understand that lactic acid is a non-volatile acid in the body, which means that it's going to produce an acid that bicarb is going to say, wait a second, I have to buffer this acid. I have to, I have to try to balance for this acid. And so that leads to a buffering and an, occup and, and an occupation of the bicarb. So the bicarb on your blood gas no longer looks available. Now, it's not that the bicarb is gone. It's just that the bicarb is occupied by all this increase in non-volatile acids. The bicarb is doing its job. It's the base. Its job is to offset acid to create a normal and try to keep a normal pH balance. This buildup of lactic acid overtakes the base and shows it to be low, which it is, which leads to this buildup of CO2. Now, the CO2 is high because there's not, perfu there's not oxygenation happening and there's not perfusion happening. And so this buildup of CO2 is happening in the body. When, by the time you draw the blood gas, you get, a, you get a blood gas that looks like this. Now, how do we treat this and how do we deal with this? What do we need to do? Well, our job as respiratory therapists is to focus on getting this CO2 back down to a normal level. We understand that if we can get this down, then we can get the pH back up. So we t we our goal should be to get the patient on mechanical ventilation. This is a patient that's status post cardiac arrest. Get the patient on mechanical ventilation. Our focus should be an increasing minute ventilation. Increasing minute ventilation. I'm gonna write it down here. Increasing minute ventilation equals decreasing CO2, which equals increasing pH. Now, if we can get this patient's pH back up then we improve this patient's chance for survival. And that's really what it comes down to, is that our job as respiratory therapists, once we get them intubated, once we get a, a what they call ROSC, R-O-S-C, return of spontaneous circulation. Now we don't have to do compressions anymore. The patient's heart has resu resumed responsibility of perfusing, okay? Of, of systemic perfusion, then, then our, our workload and our work focuses on getting CO2 down by increasing minute ventilation.
You put this person on a minute ventilation of five to six liters per minute, you're not gonna get rid of this CO2 of 70. You put this person on a, on a minute ventilation of nine to 10 liters per minute, you're gonna get this CO2 down, it's gonna come back down, and it'll help this pH go back up. Now, that fixes the CO2, but how do we fix the bicarb? That comes in this situation, status post cardiac arrest. Once ROSC is received, return of spontaneous circulation. What do we need to do? We need to focus on oxygenation and perfusion of the tissues. And that will decrease the lactic acid. As the lactic acid goes down, our bicarb will restore itself. It will become free again. As lactic acid goes down, bicarb becomes free and it returns back to our base and we'll see our bicarb start to go up. Now, as our bicarb goes up, so does our pH. And we return to a state of a normal pH with a normal CO2 and hopefully a normal bicarb. And we can take this patient that had an episode of a cardiac arrest and we can hopefully, one day, hopefully get them extubated and get them off and they can live successfully and, and move on and be discharged from the hospital and, and go on with life. Look, everybody who goes through cardiac arrest who presents with this doesn't die. It's not a death sentence. It might be in the moment, but if we understand what we're doing and we understand what our role is and our role as respiratory, respiratory therapies is to get this CO2 under control. Now, the best way you can do this is by institution of an entitled CO2. You can use an entitled CO2, draw a blood gas, you know your gradient between arterial CO2 and entitled CO2, and then you can use that entitled CO2 to increase minute volume to get your gradient, to get your CO2 down to where it needs to be. This is something that I see is severely lacking in most institutions. If you use entitled CO2 and you use it effectively, meaning that every morning you get a report and you know what the entitled CO2 gradient is and you know what our goals are for ventilation, I want you to leave a comment right here, right now. I've asked this question before and I got zero comments. I'm going to ask it again. If you use entitled CO2 and your facility uses it effectively, to distinguish the gradient between arterial and entitled CO2 and you give that gradient off in report or you receive that gradient report and you make vent changes without drawing a blood gas to move your entitled CO2 based off of your gradient to achieve your desired arterial CO2, leave a comment. I want to see, I, I'm just curious guys, I just want to know really seriously how often this happening because from what I can tell and what I've seen, entitled CO2 is severely underutilized. Okay, so that's just one example. I got on my soapbox for a minute and I apologize to you, but I just, I'm passionate about entitled CO2 because I see it as an area that we could use to decrease the patient sticks, hospital cost, improve mechanical ventilation management, and hopefully reduce the number of, of mechanical ventilator days and, and get these patients extubated sooner. I don't know if it'll work or not, but that's just what I see. It's what I believe and, and what I'd like to see more involvement in. If you do that, let me know. Now, this is one example. Now, I want to give you another example. Now, the thing about this is, is that I don't really have to change the numbers much, okay? This patient is not a status post cardiac arrest patient. This patient is DKA. This patient is not your typical DKA because most DKA patients come in with a partially compensated respiratory acidosis. So that's not what the question is. The question is, is about mixed acidosis. So most of our DKAs come in with something like this. The CO2 is way down, bicarb is way down, and our pH is acidotic. And the CO2 is way down because the patient is Kushmal's breathing. They have a high rate and a high tidal volume and are blowing off lots of CO2. And this person may not need to be intubated if 
we can get them started on an insulin drip and get the bicarb under control at a reasonable rate, then we may not have to intubate this patient. But if the opposite is true, if the patient presents like this, CO2 of 60, and let's just say we have a pH of 6.9. Now, some of you may be thinking that's not compatible with life, but I'm going to tell you something right now. It is. I've seen it multiple times, and it is. So if this patient comes in, then we need to understand that if this is DKA, we need to do one of two things. First of all, for us, we need to intubate the patient, mechanically ventilate them. And what do we need to do? The same thing as the previous example. We need to hyperventilate this patient. We need to get this 60 down to 30. That'll help bring the pH up. The other thing we need to do outside of what we typically administer is we need to start an insulin drip and we need to get this bicarb freed up because this bicarb is tied up by all the ketones from the diabetic ketoacidosis. And once the bicarb comes up, then the pH comes up the rest of the way. Okay, These are just two examples, guys. Just two examples of mixed acidosis where you have a decreased bicarb and an increased CO2. From a respiratory therapy standpoint, our goal in those patients is one, get the CO2 down. If we can get the CO2 down, we will help to get the pH up while the medical team focuses on fixing the metabolic problem, whether it be tissue hypoxia or, or DKA, or whatever it may be, our goal should be to get the CO2 down. We can always help fix the pH. We can't always help fix the patient. But if we can get the pH down, we can help the CO the pH. If we can get the CO2 down, then we can get the pH up. And if we can get the pH up, then we're gonna buy time and we're gonna improve the outcomes for this patient. So that's what I have to say about mixed acidosis. Understand your role. Understand what you can control. Don't ever intubate and mechanically ventilate a patient and normalize their minute ventilation. Don't ever take a patient with a high CO2 and say, okay, I'm going to put them on a rate of 500, a, a tidal volume of 500 and a rate of 12. That's a minute volume of 6. That's not going to reduce the CO2. If you have a high CO2, get your CO2 down. Beyond that, focus on tissue perfusion, oxygenation. If it's DKA, focus on the administration of insulin and the hanging of, of fluids. And that will help to improve your bicarb status. Okay. Hey, Kwaku, I, hate, I thank you for, for asking this question. I hope I helped clarify some things. If I didn't, leave another message below. If you're watching this and you have a question, leave a message below. I'll look at it. I'll answer it. I'll get to it when I can. And I appreciate you guys watching. At the end of all of this, I just hope that everybody is learning. Not just from my videos, but I hope you're learning in your school studies. And at the very, very least, hit the subscribe button. The worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to get a couple videos a week showed up in your inbox. Watch them if you want to. Don't if you don't. It's as simple as that. I appreciate you guys for watching. I appreciate any comments, any likes, and any messages anybody sends to me. Go be great, guys.